While it's pretty agreed upon that Demon Slayer is carried by its adaption, the story of Demon Slayer is not without good moments of storytelling. There's been a couple of good emotional moments, Ducky and Gutara's farewell got me pretty good, and I think generally characterization is something done quite well. Most of the characters are solid and are fairly unique and interesting, even the main character who stands out with his incredible anime superpower of actually having a knows. But no, it's such a vast array of quirky characters, a goody two-shoes character who upholds honours and manners and politeness actually has a lot of opportunities to express that, and I would have never expected a character having manners could stand out. So there's good stuff in the story, but when I say the story is weak, I'm not talking about this stuff. What I'm really talking about is plot, which is a much more specific term that I'll try to explain here because I've recently wrapped my head around it, and I noticed Demon Slayer clearly started to as well. So initially the problem with Demon Slayer was that the plot felt quite weak, and by that I mean it was barely there. Which debatably early on was probably more to its benefit. For the first season, basically each episode had its own self-contained fight, breaking up the story even if the fight had no real impact on it. Which is great if all your anime has apparently learnt the breathing styles from the show and then landed on cocaine breathing. But it was rather samey, and once you get to the bigger arcs, this problem gets exacerbated because suddenly episodes could go by without a fight, because you're building up to this big one. And there's two ways you can deal with this, either you can do what Mugen Train did and have these little minion fights and moments of action to break things up at the expense of pace, or you can do what Entertainment District Arc did and just simply try to have a story leading up to that fight. The whole thing kind of plays out like a reconnaissance mission with mystery elements, it has no fights outside of a few action cuts for three episodes, and it really just felt like, oh, are we there? Are we Are we, Are we? we in the Entertainment District? Because I, I, I just, just not feeling very fucking entertained right now! Again, characters are good, I love a good loud and proud character and Tengen checks out. Man is so self-absorbed he got three wives and then used the wedding rings for his fucking biceps. But in terms of plot, the first three episodes, I just didn't care. But when I got to Swordsmith, I was actually invested in this early portion despite it being similar in amounts of small action breaking it up. But why? So a while ago I did this video on Arcane about world building, where I argued the core of what makes engaging world building is not realism, detail, scale, or even creativity, it's connections. A fictional world isn't real, it's simply words on paper that you interpret as a world. If nothing connects those words, that's not a world, that's a list of ideas. The more you interweave, the more you make connections between different concepts, make things dependent on other things, make multiple things originate from the same thing, the more you reuse things in different contexts and establish things that remain consistent, the the more it feels connected, and the more it feels like a world. But there's one offhand line in that video that made me realise something. I said, there's almost a feeling of object permanence whenever something is reused in a story. It's, it's a connection between two scenes. I think most take stories for granted, assuming that just because our media has its own brand and intended watch order, the people will innately feel like it's part of the same thing. But what is a story? It's not real, it's just images on screen played in a certain order that we interpret as a story. Fucking me 2021. And I think about this now and I'm like, oh, that's what a plot is. Everything I said here about world building applies equally to plot. They're the same engagement. It's all just connections. When one idea on a piece of paper is reused for another idea on another piece of paper, our brain connects it, perceives it as real, and is engaged by it. When one image is followed by another image that's slightly changed, our brain connects it, perceives it as real, and is engaged by it. And when one action in one scene appears to have a resulting effect on something else in another scene, our brain connects it, perceives it as real, and is engaged by it. That's a plot. So now we know that plot is connections, let's look at Demon Slayer. In fact, let's just look at the name. Swordsmith Village Arc. Swordsmith Village Arc. Do you notice the immediate difference? Unlike Infinity Train or Entertainment District, Swordsmiths are intrinsically connected to a bunch of different prior scenes, because it's the whole established system for how Slayers get their swords. In fact, this arc is technically connected to every single scene where a Demon Slayer sword is visible. So the second the story starts interacting with the village, when you see how they get there, how it's hidden because of its importance, when you see the masks of the swordsmiths and see them work, it has a feeling of connection other arcs didn't have, and a much deeper one because it ties together things that are much more distant. Yes, every episode in Entertainment District is connected to every other episode in Entertainment District via the Entertainment District, and that is its own connection, but it's a very weak one compared to Swordsmith linking tons of different episodes together seasons back. This is probably the reason that really good foreshadowing can absolutely blow people's minds. It's a twist connection, a realization that a connection was there the whole time. 
When Chapter 122 of Attack on Titan showed the name of Chapter 1 was a specific reference to something happening in this chapter and revealed panels that literally already cryptically appeared all the way back in the ending of Season 2, it destroyed people. And why wouldn't it? It proved without a shadow of a doubt that even 122 chapters on, it was all connected from the very start, and it waited 122 chapters to reveal it to you. But even if you're not getting crazy with it and planning things out, you can still take stuff that you've used before and reuse it, especially in different ways. Because it's not just that we go to Swordsmith Village, we also make use of the most prominent swordsmith in the show. Uh, the, um, uh, I don't remember his name, the guy that would make a good novelty teapot. He's not only the whole reason we're here, but also his specific character traits that we know him for, rather than get retconned or wasted in favour of whatever the mangaka wants to do with him, are instead maintained, just totally recontextualized. He gets mad every time Tanjiro breaks his sword, but then you find out that according to his culture, that's his responsibility, and he's probably just insecure about it. So he tries to murder you, Uwu. So it doesn't just reuse his characteristics, they give a new understanding of his character that still lines up logically with his previous interactions. So it draws a new connection to his character in previous arcs, not just visually, but logically, which we'll talk more about in a bit. But that's not to undersell the visually part of this either. Logic and recontextualizing aside, even just simple reuse can make things more interesting. Demon Slayer is no masterclass in storytelling, but it doesn't have to be. The ultimate takeaway from this video is that it is important to recycle. Even if you had no plans to use them, don't let story elements go to waste. Disregarding villains, in Swordsmith, there are four characters in this arc that get recycled from ages ago. Yes, the main three characters are used for Entertainment District, but again, just having immediate reoccurring characters is a weak connection by itself. Obviously, when you see Tanjiro in episode 2 after seeing him in episode 1 you're like oh fuck shit it's that guy but when you see Genya again then that's when you go oh shit it's him because obviously it's been longer and you're not expecting to see him so the connection feels stronger because it connects things that were previously thought to be distant and when you think about it this is the basis for how cameos work it's why people go ballistic for returning characters and the reason why it's a reliable move for Marvel to be like oh hey you know this character don't you Ooh, look at that trailer Ooh, spicy cameo oh oh good you bought your ticket okay back in the box and of course, investment is part of this. You don't do this when you see Genya when you do with Spider-Man, because Spider-Man is popular. But my point is it can be both. Connection is a big part of it too. And the thing that made me realize that was Demon Slayer. Because I don't really give a shit about Genya, and I certainly don't give a shit about Swordsmiths, which isn't even a character. But even so, when I reached this arc and subsequent moments, I felt that engagement. I wasn't bored, and I was curious to see where it would go. In fact, if there is one thing that really holds this new season of Demon Slayer back, it's probably that none of what I'm saying here really applies to the actual main villains of this arc. Uh, hold on, uh, spoilers for the outcome of Swordsmith, if you don't want to know who wins this arc's battle, uh, skip to here. The thing that holds the season back is that they picked like the worst characters to actually be the main antagonists of this arc. There's obviously already a plan for Akaza as part of a revenge-esque plotline for Tanjiro after Rengoku was killed, and they obviously didn't plan to blow the top two upper moons at this point in the story, so it's got to be the next in the order of the arbitrary 12 top bad guys they picked, neither of which actually existed before this arc, and it kind of shows with both these characters feeling very two-dimensional and sort of feel like they were just thrown together just so something could be beaten for slots four and five of the upper moons. Unfortunately, I think this probably affects the action as well. This arc's battle is not as dramatic or extended as Entertainment District, which was presumably supposed to be a big deal because it was the first Upper Moons to be defeated in like a hundred years or whatever. But Swordsmith has even stronger Upper Moons, yet does not have that same feeling of a hard-fought battle. And it's probably because these guys were effectively filler characters and beating them was more of a formality for the creator rather than something they wanted to spend a lot of time on. Which was probably the wrong approach, probably should have fleshed them out anyway, whatever. God, I really wish it was Akaza and Doma though. In the villain standoff scene, I was, I was hoping, I was hoping man, I was so disappointed to see it was those fuckers. Could you imagine how good this arc would have been if you had one, a villain with connected history, and two, a villain who wasn't two-dimensional? In fact, I posit this arc should have gone further. It should have been a loss for the heroes. You're telling me they found the secret important village that's the source of the Demon Slayer's power, and Muzan wasn't like, 
I'm gonna throw the whole kitchen sink at this bitch. It should have been like at least four upper moons all at once. It should have been a massacre with our heroes clinging on until help arrives and then an all out battle. Any important upper moons and Hashira survive by the skin of their teeth because the sun comes up, but they're unable to save the swordsmiths who all get massacred, which should then make a huge impact on the story because now every sword is precious and Tanjiro loses out on getting a new sword made for him, making the ancient sword being polished his only hope. Anyway, point is, the actual villains being fought in this arc really hold it back. If they use literally any other antagonist, it could have been amazing, and it would have been amazing for the exact reasons I'm outlining here. Because probably the best example in Demon Slayer of investing your audience in a narrative through connections, and why you can tell it it's not just about investment, is with characters who haven't even been named yet and still evoke a really strong reaction. This season of Demon Slayer actually has the coolest example of this with the upper moons. He's just unfortunately not the one in this arc's battle, but he is here. Are you sick of generic villain meetings where they do nothing but spin wheels? Well, Demon Slayer has got twists. You get to see the number one upper moon for the first time, and he visually connects with the random Demon Slayer that's shown up a few times in people's memories, and has the same style of fighting that our main character unlocked in Season 1. And this creates a really strong connection through the distance of it. This character has only ever been presented in memories, so it implies he's chronologically distant, and he's never been presented as a bad guy, so he's nonsensically distant as well. Logically, it doesn't make sense, but the story seems to be aware of that, so the story is really announcing, hey, there's a visual connection here, which means there's a logical connection too. We're just not telling it to you yet. Boom, that's what a mystery is. This is the other reason you can tell that reappearances and cameos are in part about connections as well. Let's look back at those Marvel cameos. What's the difference between a shameless cameo and one that feels well done? Easy, it's the difference between a character only being connected visually by simply being there, and one that is connected logically. Logic is its own type of connection, and it's what we typically think of when we say plot. When one scene explains or leads into another, or when we say action should have consequences in a story, or that rules should be consistent, they are just another form of connection that can be used to connect one scene, one line of dialogue, one frame of animation to another, and make it all feel connected. And Demon Slayer actually doubles up on this. This season, if you are being totally incompetent as a writer, you might be like, okay, I want to level up my main character because I need him to be able to fight the bigger guys. So let's just put him through a generic boot camp. No, that's bad. Do what Demon Slayer did instead. In the first episode of the season, they show you this antagonist at the villain meeting. And then right after, you see his visual appearance standing behind two good guys having a conversation. What's that about? Do you see how that makes such a strong connection? This is a bad guy. He's presumably hundreds of miles away, but now he's here? And no one knows he's a bad guy, and he presumably has history here, because they're talking about him. What a strong connection to make between two different scenes and an amazing cliffhanger. And of course in the next episode it pulls it back and you see he's not actually the guy, but all it does is change the connections. You find out it's an automatic training doll based off a samurai from hundreds of years ago, so it's not the same guy, but they're connected, which if anything deepens the connections of whatever the fuck is going on here, because now you have a few different versions of this character. To add insult, you find out through his inherited memory concepts that he was around when Tanjiro's father was, so now he has connections to Tanjiro as well. It's cool, but we're not done. Now that we've done all that, we now have a training dummy for our MC's training arc that is intrinsically connected to the plot. How cool is that? And it has payoff with another connection too. When the training dummy is beaten and ends his training arc, there's a whole old ass sword hidden in the dummy, meaning it continues the connections of this plot point by Tanjiro having a sword now connected to this dude. It's also a connected payoff to what Mitsuri said in the first episode of there being a rumor of something that will make you stronger being in the swordsmith village. And then this connects to the reappearance of Tanjiro's swordsmith, who's the whole reason and connective logic why we're here in the first place. Who's like, I'm not going to make you a sword anymore because I keep accidentally making them out of mood rings and they suck, so instead, I'm going to polish this one for you. And of course, he would need to polish it. It's a sword that's been a tree dummy for hundreds of years. Of course it's rusted. It all just perfectly logically connects. And so in retrospect, you have this really tight plot line that got you here. Novelty teapot dude is assigned as Tanjiro's swordsmith. It's established he gets angry every time Tanjiro breaks his creations. Wait, I remembered his name. It's fucking Winry behind that mask, isn't it? Tanjiro breaks it too many times, so Winry goes missing. Tanjiro goes to the village to find her. Winry's actions get recontextualized by the village elder. Mitsuri tells Tanjiro about the thing that makes him stronger. 
He goes to look for it, he finds a train dummy that's also linked into the plot, he beats it and finds a sword, and Winry comes out of hiding so she can restore it for Tanjiro and do the right thing by him because she's secretly insecure about it because her swords keep breaking. And things can still be improved of course, like it'd be good if the pot demon. It sounds like someone's high school nickname. Finding the village connected logically to an event in the previous arc, but instead he just kind of knows about the village and where it is. But compare this to the rest of Demon Slayer. Crow says, there's a demon here. They go there. They fight a dude. Maybe a Hashira goes too. Maybe he dies. Maybe not. Next arc, Crow says, hey, yo, there's a fucking demon. Go there. Am I, am I, am I living on the equator? Re really, am I, am I living on the equator? Because every season is the fucking same. But that's why there's just a complete lack of plot, of organic connections. The only real time we get these kind of connections, they're usually either contained within the same arc and usually come at the end where they're less impactful, such as Rengoku's family in the aftermath of Mugen Train, or the arrival of the Hashira on Mount Natagumu. And the logical connections tend to be fairly loose with Rengoku's dad kind of just knowing about sun breathing and the earring dude, because of presumably his fire breathing being close like elementally. And the Hashira who only came at the end after the Demon Slayer Corp sent out a politely worded email apologizing profusely to the families of the Demon Slayer they sent to their grave while simultaneously absolving themselves of any wrongdoing. Now the best example was probably the Hand Demon, because you're led to believe the final selection is brutal and that's why all of Urodaki's previous students died, leading him to try and stop Tanjiro from going. But when you get there, you find out that there was a specific demon identifying Urukodaki's students through their clothes and intentionally targeting them, and that's why they all died. It wasn't even a mystery, it was a twist logical connection. Good stuff. It's all just about connecting one scene to another. I mean, is it any surprise that despite having more action, the most boring segment of Mugen Train was the dream segment. Dreams are logically disconnected from everything else in your story. Nothing in them has logical consequence, which is also part of why it feels like ass if you have the woke up and it was all a dream ending, because you just retroactively waved a million different logical connections between your story and your ending and replaced it with a single weak logical connection. It was all a dream. And this is probably why filler is boring and why things can feel like filler even if they're actually in the source material. Connections are why things feel like part of the story. So when it comes to cameos, the more you're able to logically connect why a cameo happens in the plot, and the more you can link it and the pieces you need to logically make it happen to what already exists, the more connected it feels, the more engaging it feels. For example, here's a shameless cameo, followed by a normal cameo, followed by a cameo that barely feels like a cameo and instead a genuine part of the story. Charles Xavier from Multiverse of Madness barely even connects to his own character outside of visually, is only run into as part of a coincidence, has zero ties to anything in the plot and has zero effect on the plot thereafter. Matthew Murdock from No Way Home feels like the same character, does have reason to appear via the main character needing a lawyer, but there's no reason for him to pick this lawyer in particular and he has no effect on the plot thereafter. And then you have the Spider-Man from the different universes that was on some level a coincidence that these specific Spider-Man was brought in, but there was a specific reason that Spider-Man got brought in, that it was a botched spell to make people forget Spider-Man was Peter Parker that ended up bringing in anyone who knew he was Peter Parker, villains included. So that logic in itself had multiple different consequences and was connected to multiple different parts of the plot thereafter. Also, the way they actually first find each other is quite clever too, because you have someone who's new with magic using a spell to find Peter Parker and then ends up getting the wrong ones. And No Way Home isn't even perfect. There are a few small things that don't logically connect or have weak logic that you could fix, but there's not really a stopping point. You could basically add connections ad infinitum. If you're clever, you could even replace some of the mechanics like the forgetting spell introduced for this plot with recycled mechanics from previous movies to make it feel tighter. This is probably why a good mystery or a recontextualizing twist like with Hotaru before can be engaging, because you've given a new understanding or a new way to use something but it still logically connects to the previous scenes. And that's especially important when you realize this works in reverse too. If you introduce something new and powerful like a forgetting spell, it can break the connection between previous movies because people are like, if you had a forgetting spell the whole time, why didn't you use it on that really big bad guy? And this has actually given me a new appreciation of YouTubers like Mola who do heavily plot hole focused critiques, spending a lot of time on things that don't make sense within a story. And if you know me, you know I'm actually one of these crazy people who thinks plot holes don't exist. But I'm starting to question it. No, my contrarian opinion, come back, I love you! 
I never got to do a video on it, but to summarize, I say that plot holes don't exist because stories aren't real, it's words on paper, so there's no absolute truth of what did or did not happen. This means everything is technically interpretive, and so when two people argue over whether or not something is a plot hole, the defender can explain away any contradiction by using what is undefined in the story or extrapolating logic from what is defined. Because again, there's no true reality, you can't fact check them. Maybe the Eagles wouldn't fly to Mordor for whatever reason. Maybe there was something about the positioning of all the ships that made the light speed ram a viable strategy here where it wasn't before. There's no shortage of fan explanations if you look for them, and people can and do argue them back and forth and back and forth. And so a plot hole seems less about any consistent science of what does and does not make sense, and more about what an audience can make sense of and what they're willing to make sense of based on how invested they are. Which is even more confusing when you realize stories can and should leave stuff up to the audience to infer because you can't explain every detail. Consider the fact that you can never technically tell the difference between a plot hole and just something that hasn't been explained yet. What if something you thought was a plot hole in episode 1, or was even designed to look like a plot hole, was actually perfectly explained by a plot twist in episode 600, and everything lined up perfectly so it was clear that that was what was going on from the very start? That could technically happen. So what does that mean? You can't say something definitively doesn't make sense until the whole series is done? That sounds stupid, obviously, but at the same time, the point of entertainment is to be entertained. Many consumers, even critical ones, go into stories giving total benefit of the doubt and assume the story must make sense. Soviet Womble just released a three hour video essay on the forest where he explains his entire journey with the game as he's trying to put together the pieces of a mystery, trying to make sense of everything and at most ponders if some pieces are actually clues or if he's not supposed to notice them. The peninsula's wildlife. The wildlife here is extremely bizarre. There are animals that are clearly American, such as the raccoon. But then we've got crocodiles and monitor lizards, species that rarely go further than the equatorial regions, and very large spiders that I think are South American? Rubbing shoulders with Canadian geese, a temperate and subarctic bird that never goes below the equator. So is that a clue? Where the fuck are we? That has deer and croc and Komodo dragons, lots of random species of bird in a fucking pine forest with snow. Is that meant to be an indication that there's something weird with the peninsula? Like the polar bear thing in Lost? That there's some fantasy interdimensional type story? And flying through that is what brought down the plane at the start? And that's going to be the mystery? Why is the wildlife so weird? Was I supposed to notice that? But he assumes it all must fit together right up until the end of the game when he realizes none of it did. And even then, there are still people after the end of the game who try to make sense of it. So there are multiple different levels of willingness of when a consumer will stop trying to make sense of a piece of media. So it's like, in order to say something definitively doesn't make sense, you'd need to first to find the correct level of willingness one must have to think of an explanation and how much willingness is too far. It's totally arbitrary. So because of stuff like this, I decided the only true plot hole is not actually a plot hole, but simply an audience member being genuinely confused and unable to think of an explanation that allows them to make sense of something in a story, even if they want to. It didn't make sense to me to think of what people call a plot hole as a flaw, something that makes a story worse, because anyone could erase that flaw if they want to. But, but, when you think of a plot hole as a lack of a logical connection, even if you explain it, it doesn't add back in the connection, because the way people explain plot holes always uses what is undefined. To make a strong connection, the story itself has to commit to it, it has to lock it in. You can't say something doesn't make sense in episode 1 because it might make sense after more episodes come out. It might even make sense now depending on the person or if someone has explained it to them in the form of a fan theory. But. You can say there is no logical connection in episode 1, and that remains true even if a later episode gives you an explanation, because the connection isn't within episode 1, it's between episode 1 and the episode that explains it. Because it's not a connection until the episode connecting it exists, and the audience member gets no engagement from that connection until they've got both sides. Even if a fan theory explains it to them, and it now makes sense, an audience member will not feel the engagement from the connection until another episode gives them the logical connection. Um, okay, I thought that, is there no, like, so the game, right, mm. So, it would only be true to say that there is a logical connection in episode 1 if both sides of that connection were given in episode 1. 
Even in the case of an explanation slash connection being implied or inferable, all it means is the more inferable or implied, the stronger the connection, and the weaker something is implied or inferable, the weaker the connection. This is why it's not good enough for critics if you explain a plot hole with significantly undefined concepts or vastly extrapolated logic, even if it makes sense, and it's why critics often don't care if there's an official explanation to a plot hole outside the source material. It's because it's a terribly weak connection when it's not actually in the source material. It's like trying to have your cake and eat it. You can't use disconnected logic to explain one thing and then simultaneously not allow yourself to be beholden to that logic when it comes to everything else in your story. For a strong connection, you must lock it in. You must submit it for evidence so that it may be used against you because that makes the connection stronger. And it's given me a new appreciation for heavy plot hole based critics like Mola, ER, JXE, Critical Drinker, etc. Because I realized a plot hole is not actually a bad thing. It's the absence of a good thing, which is sort of a nebulous difference. It's still a critique. But in my mind, these critiques aren't really about things that don't make sense. They're really about missed opportunities to strengthen the logical connections. They just demonstrate it by pointing out how things don't connect. Boom. This was supposed to be a video about Demon Slayer. <laughs> at any rate, I read ahead of the manga for this video, and at least for this arc, it doesn't seem to be a coincidence. The trend of connections keeps going. There's connections between the Miss Hashiro and Tanjiro and their techniques. The two scene with Genyu is foreshadowing for his abilities, and he also has mixed motives to kill an upper moon. So he plays a bit of a wild card in the plot of the fight, and Tanjiro actually works with that logically. It's, it's neat. None of this is to say that this is like amazing storytelling, right? It's honestly a fairly basic lesson that I just didn't understand before. It's such a basic lesson that its effect is hard to even register because it's so subtle, but man do I notice it now that I put it into words. Recently I've been watching Ruby Volume 9 and Better Call Soul, which is a combo, but the difference in connections is so stark. Better Call Soul is like the end game of everything I've mentioned here. Everything is connected, constantly. Main characters are so smartly set up that they can run into each other naturally. A plots and B plots are constantly intertwining, details never get forgotten, minor plot points from season 1 get used as logic for plot points later on, and oh my god it's so efficient with minor characters. They're constantly recycled and brought back in and the plot just feels tight, 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 yeah! Meanwhile, in Ruby, they take you to a whole ass new world, introduce multiple new characters who are literally important enough to be in the opening, but they literally exist as obstacles for a single episode they're introduced, and then you never see them again! And now I think of it, I think it's one of the big stylistic differences between Western live action and Eastern style animation. There's exceptions obviously, but anime likes to have an engagement goal and create a lot of things to get to that goal even if it's wasteful, but Western live action, either because of its higher focus on realism or maybe because of the limitations of live action, is more opportunistic with its engagement because it uses what it has available and thereby has a tighter plot. Which explains why anime can hit greater highs for me but Western live action can feel more engaging all around. One heavily focuses connections and the other heavily focuses other engagements. Huh? What's that? Uh, why did I do a video on Demon Slayer when it was the middle of the road example and Better Call Saul was the peak example of plot? Uh, I may possibly play the YouTube game by looking at my current storytelling research and then finding something trending that it best applies to so I don't have to get a job where I'm not thinking about storytelling.